Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to uh, the FCC. Thanks for joining us despite uh, the public events, as the government likes to uh, put it, and I guess we'll get that later. Um, the club obviously appreciates your support despite the difficult circumstances. My name is Florence de Changy. I'm the former president of uh, the club and the correspondent uh, for Le Monde, a French uh, newspaper and the French national radio, and uh, delighted to be uh, your host today. Please uh, don't forget to turn your phone on silent mode because we are uh, live streaming on uh, Facebook. Uh, and obviously feel free to tweet uh, if you do. Now about today's talk, I am uh, professionally and personally very happy to host uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Gapistan to discuss his latest book, China Tomorrow, Democracy or Dictatorship. I wouldn't hold my breath <laughs> until I find out, but uh, I know that the title, I mean that the book is far from uh, that simple. Uh, it has actually been widely praised for its remarkable insight of inside uh, the CCP box. And uh, the French version uh, also won a very prestigious prize of the French Academy. So it's not only fascinating for its content, but apparently uh, very well written as well. And, and Jean-Pierre very kindly brought me the, the book in French. Um, now, but the English one is available, and you will be able to buy it and have your sign, um, have uh, Jean-Pierre to, to sign uh, your book after the talk. Just a few words about Professor Cabestan. Um, China expert is an understatement, I guess. Uh, Jean-Pierre has been traveling to China in and out since 1977 a lot in the 80s, in particular, uh, to research his uh, PhD. He's also had two long uh, bouts in Hong Kong just after the handover until uh, 2003, and now again since uh, 2007, uh, when he came to be the head of the political science department at Baptist U. It's obviously not his first uh, talk uh, at the FCC. Apparently his cupboard is already full of our ties, so the good news is going to get someone else, uh, something else uh, today. But um, his first talk was exactly 20 years ago about Li Teng uh, ID of the two states. Because Taiwan is actually one of Jean-Pierre's specialty fields, um, along with Chinese politics, Chinese foreign and security policy, relations across the Taiwan Straits, obviously, and China-Africa relations. Um, and of course, Jean-Pierre uh, also uh, confirmed that he'll be happy to say a few words about the um, Hong Kong situation. Most of his stu students at uh, Baptist U surely would be at the front line of the movement, so uh, that would be surely uh, fascinating as well. Without uh, further ado, please uh, welcome Professor Jean-Pierre Cabestan. Thanks a lot, Florence, for these kind words. Thank you to the FCC. Thank you, Jody, for um, hosting me again uh, in this very nice uh, dining room. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be with you and to recognize many friendly faces around here yeah, today, and uh, new friends as well. Um, I'm going to talk uh, mainly about uh, China, but of course I can't uh, miss this occasion to say a few words about Hong Kong. Sh should I speak a bit closer to the microphone? Okay. Um, I think, in a sense, the Hong Kong and the Hong Kong situation is at the heart of my book. Um, here you've got uh, what I've called, and uh, for quite some time, a clash of political values. A clash between the political values which still dominate in China, the ones uh, pro promoted by the Chinese Communist Party, and the ones uh, which uh, dominate here in the Hong Kong as a community, as a special administrative region of the PRC, liberal values in a, in a political sense. And how do we reconcile those two sets of values? Um, well, what we've seen in the streets in the last few months um, tend to indicate that it's very hard, actually, to find a reconciliation. And we have uh, now a hybrid political system in Hong Kong, which is, I'm afraid, here to stay. 
because of that uh, impossible mixture or impossi impossibility of mixing a one-party system with a multi-party democracy. You have to choose either or. or. And the unfortunate uh, fate of Hong Kong is to be uh, uh, under the, uh, the rule of a, a one-party system, which is uh, the, the dominant system in mainland China. So I don't know how you can solve this issue, uh, except that, uh, of course, we're living a revolution. But uh, I'm afraid that I'm rather pessimistic that it will be very hard for Hong Kong David to win over China Goliath in the, in the foreseeable future. In the foreseeable future, because in the longer term, who's going to win? Maybe Fukuyama will be right. We'll see. Um, I have, um, on purpose, sort of um, rehabilitated, at least partly rehabilitated, uh, Francis Fukuyama, who we remember very well, in 1989 predicted the end of history, um, democracy, the end of the Cold War, and democracy uh, had prevailed everywhere, and that's uh, and there was no way or no risk of uh, moving back to, an, an previous, to the previous era where authoritarian system uh, dominated. Uh, he was wrong, and uh, I think he has recognized that. Uh, but whether he eventually become right, as far as China is concerned, I think remains an open question. The major uh, ar argument of my book, in a nutshell, uh, is that the Communist Party regime is strong, still very strong, that adaptation to the environment still um, um, dominates and uh, um, sort of uh, mitigates the risk of erosion we've all seen that the party state is a very well organized um, apparatus uh, which is based on a very old uh, administrative tradition uh, and that uh, the party state has delivered uh, a lot to the Chinese people in the last 40 years. And, but one thing which has been sort of underestimated by a lot of observers, I guess, is that uh, actually, I'm sure if you, know, you go to China, I mean in China, you very quickly realize that a lot of Chinese, you know, Chinese of the street, as we say, uh, ordinary Chinese support the regime. And, uh, and that's, to me, uh, a quandary, and that's a, a kind of a puzzle, which I wanted to sort of uh, unpack and see better what, what, what's going on and why people are so supportive of the regime. The uh, big question, of course, the big question mark is um, down the road, how can such a one-party system evolve over the years? whether it can you know, move towards another political system and, uh, or whether it will remain a kind of uh, authoritarian, paternalistic, uh, imperial, but also very elitist um, political system. Now, and that's my provisional uh, sort of conclusion at this stage. Now, these books were triggered by a debate which has been going on for some time in, in the US, but also in Europe, about China's political future. Uh, one of the immediate uh, triggers of that book was David Chambo's book. Uh, David is a very old friend, uh, but uh, I don't agree, fully agree with his book called uh, titled China's Future, which was published, I think, in 2015, if I remember well. Um, there was another uh, book uh, published more recently by Min Xin Pei, Pei Min Xin, I'm sure you know him, uh, well-known uh, American uh, Chinese uh, authors who thinks that corruption is going to sort of kill the regime in the foreseeable future, and he, predicts, he has predicted the, that the Chinese Communist Party will, you know, and the, and the PRC won't survive much longer than the Soviet Union, 77 years maybe. So, um, I, I tend to disagree with him. And, and a, a third author I mention here is uh, Andrew Nathan from Columbia University, you may have heard of. Uh, for a long time, he sort of promoted the idea of, uh, I mean, uh, of um, um, political resilience. The resilience of the regime has been very strong. And he, but in, 20, 12, in 2012, because of the Bosilai affair and what happened, you know, the crisis within China, he started to move away from that. He said, maybe, you know, the regime is not that resilient. So those three friends, actually, they're all good friends, sort of... Uh, convinced me, apart from my wife who is present, <laughs> present here, who was, uh, I think was uh, the whip in the family to sort of convincing me to write this book in the summer of 2017 instead of going to Africa to do some more field work. So that's what I did. So the first version of that book was actually written in the summer of 2017 and, uh, and published in French last year. Uh, and, and to sort of put together 
um, my own ideas about you know China's uh, regime, the Chinese regime, political future, and so it's a, just a you know a simple contribution to the debate, and I don't I don't think it's the final answer, far from it, and I uh, just want to sort of contribute and and sort of stimulate the debate a bit a bit further. Um, now. Uh, I don't have much time, so I mean, I'm looking at that watch, and I want, to, I, I want to make a few points regarding the, the content of the book itself. Okay. Um, first of all, my first question is, why do Chinese people support the CCP? Now, it's not, it's, it's not based on ether, actually it's based on uh, opinion polls, uh, which have been conducted by a number of people in China. Um, my, uh, there's been well, a num number of, uh, of, of polls which have, and surveys which I've mentioned in my book. But it's amazing that even uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago already, 84% uh, of the Chinese believed that their country was democratic. Now, it may have gone down according to most recent opinion polls in 2016 uh, to 63% support the political system the way it is. Uh, it's, it, they think that the political system and the party, the Communist Party, represent their interests and serve the people. What do you mean for who in Chinese, as you know? So, um, now, of course, you can say that's part of China's tradition. Uh, government, you know, if you, if you look at the well-known um, classical sinologist uh, Theodore de Barry, uh, he said uh, about the Song, the Ming Dynasty, uh, the, the rulers will, will serve the people, but, uh, so it was a government for the people, but not ne and never in Chinese tradition by the people. I agree with that. But my own point on that is that uh, we forget about what has happened since uh, the opium wars in China, since the end of the 19th century. There's been a lot of um, debates in China about what kind of political system should China adopt. Uh, and uh, what the people in mainland China, have, I think there's kind of a political amnesia about, about those debates, starting with Yan uh, Fu, with Kang Yo Wei, Yang Qi Chao, and then of course Sun Zhongzhan, uh, Sun Yat-sen, and others. Uh, Hu Shizhi and, and uh, I think there's been always a liberal and, and democratic tradition in China. I mean, always for at least for one century, over, over a century. Uh, but of course, the Communist Party uh, um, was very keen to su suppress the tradition and to sort of make sure that the Chinese people and the men would forget about it. And uh, at th my argument is that the, in 1949, the Communist Party established a Soviet tradition, a new tradition, created a new Soviet political culture which was, has been imposed on the Chinese society for 70 years. That's long. And that has quite a big of impact on the way people behave and, and relate to the authorities in China. And that's my main argument. Even the language has been changed by the Communist Party, which is no surprise, you know, the Soviet did the same, Lenin and Stalin did the same with the Russian language. Um, and uh, so, so that's my... Um, main argument to sort of demonstrate why people have that view of uh, the, and, and why they do remain distant from the political system and from politics. Um, now, my, uh, we can come back to that in the Q&A. My second um, uh, argument, of course, is that maybe uh, political beliefs, values are not enough, uh, and the Communist Party has uh, sort of based its power on, on a lot of control and repression as well. So it's a mixture of belief, but also uh, tools of control and repressions. Uh, I have a chapter on the China's uh, civil society, which I see uh, being very much on the leash. And, and, and the Chinese Communist Party has adapted to this new environment where you have um, many more forces at play in the society, um, all the way from private businesses to NGOs to, um, and, and uh, all sort of uh, intermediary groups. And I'm, I've tried in that chapter to see why, why people um, sort of um, don't rock the boat too much. Of course, uh, and the party has been very good at winning over a lot of NGOs and actually funding the NGOs in order to, in order to control them. Um, the same would apply to the internet, which uh, has developed very quickly in China. Of course, there's a lot of surveillance. But at the same time, most people don't need a VPN. Only 90 million Chinese have a VPN. Well, it's not a small number, but 90 million out of uh, 800 million uh, netizens, it's, it's a small minority. And so they, 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 they sort of accommodated the system and, and, and they, they accept it. The other thing is the Communist Party has remained very attractive for everyone who wants to succeed in China. 
And that's why, you know, a lot of Chinese students overseas, they, they, they be very, they, they not only silent, but they, they, they keep an eye on their neighbors because that will help them enter in, uh, getting into the party and being promoted in the system. Um, now, you can say that there are forces which are, didn't exist in the Mao and which are pretty much at play now, like the religious revival. Uh, but by and large, religious, gr religious groups in China are not political. They stay away from politics. What they want to is to, to, to sort of protect and, and their autonomy and, and, and survive, but they, don't want, they would not take the chance of uh, getting, uh, a, part of, with a few exceptions, um, the getting into politics. So, so the society it says is in, on, on, clearly on the leash and will remain so. And I, I see the, the party being very successful. The final element, of course, is the uh, social credit system, which, in a way, it's a very clever system because it preempts any future disruption or future disorder as China is getting urbanized, very quickly urbanized. You have now 60% of the society which lives in cities, which is for uh, it's unprecedented in China. China was traditionally a rural society with only less than 20% living in the city. Now you have 60% tomorrow, maybe 20, 20%, 70%. It means that uh, with that concentration of people in cities, and we know that in Hong Kong we live in urban areas, yeah, the risks of uh, unrest and uh, chaos are much higher than when the people were scattered in the countryside. So. And that's why they introduced, uh, it's one of the reasons they introduced the social credit system, in order to keep an eye on everyone and to preempt unrest. And I think it's going to be pretty efficient. We'll see how it goes, because you, you know, even the best dictators can't control the whole situation. But that's, I wanted to add that element, because it explains why um, the party has uh, introduced that uh, social credit system. Now, let's move to... Uh, some, uh, a chapter uh, um, which is about the elites, because in final analysis, who is going to decide about the future of the political system will be the elites. Now, we know very little about the elites within the party, and I, I, don't, I won't say anything about, about them because, uh, you know, any Gorbachev would need to be remain under uh, very secret, uh, uh, hidden or, or hooded very, very long before coming out and, 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 make, and, and trying to ch impose changes over the party. So, uh, you know, uh, there are no... Um, you know, visible Gorbachev within the party. Now, what I'm interested in, and I have a section on that, is on the private entrepreneurs, whether they, are, they, will be, they can become a force of political change or not. For the time being, they are not. They're clearly very obedient to the party. They know that their interest is um, uh, getting in good terms with the party at the local level in particular. And, um, and uh, now they may disagree I mean, with Xi Jinping's policy, which is to put them on the shorter leash and to impose upon part private entrepreneurs party sales, party committees. And, uh, but, but for the time being, I think uh, they, are, they are very much uh, you know, inclined to, to toe the line. For how long? And that's a question for the future, actually. Uh, but for the time being, they, they are not a, a, a force uh, which, uh, which really can threaten the Communist Party domination. Now, what about the intellectuals? Um, now, the intellectuals in China, I mean, the ones who speak in public or even in private are mainly, uh, and that's my main, major argument, sort of new left or neo-traditionalist uh, intellectuals. The party has restored Confucianist as uh, one of its uh, ideological uh, tenets, and uh, and you've got these new Confucianists uh, justifying, I mean, taking out of Confucius the most author authoritarian part of his, of his thought to justify the one-party system, the party dictatorship, and that the pe Chinese people, they don't like democracy the way the Westerners they like democracy because they like hierarchy, they like order, and they like harmony. And that's, uh, this argument is displayed in every uh, newspaper, but also by a lot of intellectuals in China today. So, so the, liberal, the liberal intellectuals have been, in particular since Sitting Pink came to power, have been sort of sidelined, they've been silenced, and uh, sometimes they've been arrested and, and repressed. So what about the counter-elites, uh, the ones uh, like, uh, in, you know, um, uh, diseased uh, Lu Xiaobo uh, or, or someone like Xu Zhuyong? Uh, they, they're not silent, uh, they're still very much um, uh, part of the game in a sense, and in the longer term, I think uh, they may have an impact. But for the time being, if you talk to Chinese in the street, no one ever heard of uh, Xu Zhuyong of, uh, or other other activists. Uh, who've, some of them have been arrested or uh, repressed and, 
um, but or, or even someone you, you, I'm sure you heard uh, Xu Zhongrun, you know, the Tsinghua professor, who uh, said a few very interesting things about Xi Jinping's uh, uh, um, uh, 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 constitutional reforms. Uh, and but but the good the good news in a way is that these people are still around. Some are, you know, uh, Xu Zhongrun, for instance, has been banned from teaching, but you can visit him in his office in Tsinghua University, has not been put into jail. So those people are going, will continue to have some influence on, on, on the society in the longer run. Now, let's move to the, you know, the final part of my book, which is to speculate about the future. That's the most, that's the most difficult part because, you know, we're all trying to speculate about what's going to happen, you know, what, what, what can trigger political change in China. Of course, the, the, the first, the first uh, cause of, uh, of uh, um, political crisis would be economic an economic crisis. Well, the economic slowdown is uh, something which you all, we're all observing, and I think the Chinese leadership is worried, very nervous about the, the slowdown and the fact that uh, it may uh, trigger some additional unrest uh, in China. But at the same time, um, I don't think that the legitimacy of the regime is only based on the growth rate. Uh, there are two other pillars of the, or, and strong pillars of the, le, this legitimacy. One is nationalism. I think nationalism has been very um, much used by the, by the Communist Party to sort of uh, as a glue to, to stick everyone around the party. And, um, and, uh, uh, and to the point that the party uh, claims to have the monopoly of nationalism. So I, I, if you are against the party, you're not patriotic. You anti, you're anti-China, uh, and that's you know it impli applies to Hong Kong, of course, in Hong Kong society. So, and, and that in China, that symbol, that 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 tool, that uh, leverage works very well. The other one is the fear of chaos, and uh, well, of course, it has to do with what happened during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I think the old generation of Chinese still have bad memories of those years, and they they would they would trump uh, freedom for stability. It would trump uh, political uh, democracy to, to, uh, to security. So you can see in terms of political values, stability, security, something which, uh, including the middle class in China, and, uh, or the middle classes, I, I use the term in, with the plural, uh, tend, to, tend to abide by. So, and, and that's why the fear of chaos, it's, it's a, another tool, another leverage that the Communist Party has been very good at using within China. It doesn't work with Hong Kong, as you can see, but it works pretty well within China. And so apart from, so it means that if you have, even if you have an economic crisis, my, my bet is the Communist Party can still rely on both nationalism and the fear of chaos to keep people around the party and the government. Now, it doesn't mean there are no grievances in China, there are a lot of grievances, you've got a lot of uh, social unrest, but the, the point uh, is that most of, of those grievances don't challenge the Communist Party. They challenge one specific policy, uh, for instance, the the construction of a polluting factory next door, uh, next to your, you know, your, 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 your living environment. Uh, but most of the unrest are not caused by political, by, for, by, by political reasons. It's more social grievances, economic grievances. So, in a sense, in accommodating those grievances, the Communist Party is adapting to, you know, sort of some kind of de facto negotiation with the people uh, involved. The, the party has adapted to and has showed flexibility within China to accommodate those grievances, as long as they are not political, of course. And the problem with Hong Kong is that the grievances in Hong Kong are very political and that they can't, they can't negotiate, they can't accommodate on, on, or compromise on those because they want to keep the party in a leading position. So, and that's, I think, one of the things which we, we have to keep in mind. Now, the final, um, of course, uh, possible uh, trigger of, uh, of, uh, of uh, political evolution within China would be international crisis. Um, I know that Pei Minxin, who read the manuscript of my book, he told me later, you know, that's something you should push a bit further because he believes, Pei Minxin, that in, an international crisis, inter a war, you know, a local war, can, can uh, uh, precipitate the end of the one party regime. I have some doubts. I, I disagree with him, actually. I think the party has been very cautious on the international state. The, the China Push, I mean, the Chinese government, the push, they push where they can push. Uh, when they feel resistance, they, very, they become cautious. And that the last thing they want to get into to a, a major war with the United States. I think for them, the survival of the Communist Party will trump everything. And that's why they won't take uh, ex uh, 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 exaggerated risks with outside of China. 
So now the question is the longer term, of course. And, 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 and you see, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of all the signs of erosion. I mentioned urbanization. I mentioned also private entrepreneurs, which, which is a force to be to reckon with because they, they have wealth, they have political capital, they have their economic capital, but also some social capital, and they, they can become a force. The party and the party has already uh, started to reckon with that force at the local level much more than we think actually. Um, another uh, unknown is uh, what about the youth? What about the young people in China? Uh, if you go around China, you realize very quickly that young people in China they live on another planet. They don't, they, they don't communicate with the other generation. For the time being, they stay away from politics. But you just imagine if they get interested in politics, what's going to happen? Uh, maybe something uh, not un, uh, uh, unlike what's happening in Hong Kong today. Uh, the the biggest question, I mean, and that's something that most Chinese don't 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 object about, is the fact that the whole country has been kidnapped by an organization, the Communist Party, which is my view, and I think it's pretty obvious, is a secret society. How can a government be controlled uh, by a secret society? For how long? People want to know what's going on in the party, how decisions are made. For the time being, they don't care. I mean, even the Chinese don't care about who is their mayor, you know, whether they, 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 they would have the power to appoint or elect their mayor or, or their governor. Uh, but down the road, as you know, as we have more taxpayers, I mean, the question about you know, the American question, of course, which is no, 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 no taxation without representation. I think down the road, some people will ask that kind of question. Now, you can push a bit further and say, okay, why people, are, why the government in China is so paranoid? You know, the level of paranoia is it because I mean, because you've you've got in China this mixture of paranoia and self confidence, and I don't have the answer. But the paranoia may indicate that actually they're not that self-confidence uh, about the, the future of the political system in the longer run. For the time being, I think they, they, they should they shouldn't be worried. But but you know even paranoids uh, they, they they have enemies and they're worried. So uh, now uh, that's why my conclusion is to sort of um, rather pessimistic. I think the 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 regime for the time being is pretty strong. You, you, you all know, I mean, you know, we're all aware of those uh, factors of erosion, um, but uh, I don't see any uh, way out of the system, any, any force being able to challenge the system. If there, is a, if there is a change within the political system, it will be within the Communist Party itself. Again, we're moving back to this black box about which we don't know, we, we know very little actually. And we know very little about the debate they're having within the black box. So my conclusion is to uh, say that the party and the regime are on the extended reprieve. Uh, but the, the biggest question down the road is how things are going to change, and with, whether you know the, the, the path towards another political system, let's say democracy, as the way we understand it, will be peaceful or non-peaceful. And that's a big question. A peaceful democratization a la Taiwanese is unlikely in China for many reasons because of the political values I mentioned in the beginning and it, will, it may be much more disruptive, much more, much more uh, uncertain than what happened in Taiwan in the late 60s, uh, 80s. Um, Singapore has been a model for China for many years but there are many differences between Singapore and China even if you know, you, you've got that authoritarian modernity in, in Singapore for a long time. I mean, the, but at the same time, the Singaporean legal legal values come from Britain. Uh, they have, well, on the paper, have a multi-party system. So there are big, big differences. So I think the change in China will be sui generis. Uh, but the, the final point I want to make is gradualism is something which is very hard to control. Any any sort of process of democratization, at one point there is a point of no return. Uh, and that's why I think the leaders in China are very paranoid and very worried of introducing even the slightest political reform because they know that very well, they know very well that as soon as they introduce some political reform, some people will ask for more. And you know, the final result is one person, one vote. So you can't, ha you can't, you can't sort of stop halfway. When you put your finger in that trigger, you, you, you have to go all the way down uh, to the full, full democratization. So again, uh, uh, now uh, my conclusion, uh, for the English edition uh, has been expanded in order to sort of reach out the American audience. I had to say a few things about Trump, about you know, what kind of policy, you know, what, 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 what should no, well, not, uh, what, what should we do? You know, with with such a China uh, in the French edition, I started to uh, address those issues, uh, but um, I, I still think that we engage. There are two kinds of engagement that um, Jim Mann said once. 
one which is to believe that in engaging China, we're going to change the system. I think it's just fantasy. Uh, in, I think we need to adopt what I call vigilant engagement, which is we have to be vigilant in protecting our values or interests, but at the same time we have to engage because China is part of the world economy. There are no other ways but to engage China. So that's, I don't believe in decoupling. I think there, there will maybe partial decoupling uh, in, in the high tech sectors, but I don't think that decoupling is a very realistic uh, 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 option for, for us. So we have to be maybe more prudent, more selective. I mean, for instance, regarding the Confucian Institutes, uh, as an example, and other things, but also more self confident uh, about our values. Uh, and, and also more modest, because I don't think even the US, I'm sorry about that, uh, even the US can't change China. China will be changed by the Chinese people itself. And again, I mean, in my final word, I mean, moving back to Fukuyama, we said one thing, one, which was, I think, pretty interesting. You don't have democracy without Democrats. And what I, my argument is today in China, there's a lack of Democrats. Maybe tomorrow there will be more. I'm sure there will be more, but it will take time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, fascinating indeed. My first question is uh, indirectly related to uh, Hong Kong, but can you uh, explain what is your understanding of the decision taking process? Because you mentioned secret society, black box, and indeed in the case of Hong Kong, everyone is really wondering who decides what, when, and we've seen Xi Jinping, I mean, uh, two weeks ago, the fourth plenum, last week, this strange meetings between Carrie Lam. It's so difficult to read through all this. Well, I think which are pretty obvious because uh, those meetings have not remained secret. Oh, there was a meeting, by the way, in June, which was semi-secret, you know, when Han Zhang, the guy in the Politburo Senate Committee in charge of Hong Kong, number seven, I don't know if he's lucky seven, unlucky seven, I call him, because <laughs> he had to deal with Hong Kong. Um, but uh, he, he came, uh, he went to Shenzhen where he met uh, Carrie Lam and they agreed upon uh, suspending the bill, uh, extradition bill, in, on, I think it was on June 14th, the day before uh, she announced the, the decision. So clearly, they, um, I mean, no important decision can be made by Carrie Lam with the endorsement without the green light coming from Beijing. Now, who in Beijing? Uh, I'm sure that Han Zhong uh, reported to and, and got the, the, the green light from, from, from Xi Jinping himself. I mean, he couldn't make a, such a decision without Xi Jinping's uh, approval. But again, we don't have any evidence of that. Uh, you know, in, in the Chinese system, every goes, I mean, including, in particular with, with Xi Jinping, who, who created so many, you know, leading groups, and new commissions, has moved the, the power from, from the government to the, to the party, much, and the parties, party organizations. Uh, nothing can be decided with him. So I think the decision to suspend the bill was approved by Xi Jinping, and the decision, to, the decision to withdraw the bill altogether, extradition bill, in, uh, the, in uh, early September, was also endorsed by Xi Jinping. Uh, in such a system, it's uh, very hard to, and then uh, to sort of uh, see you otherwise. And then the latest meeting, you know, with between Xi Jinping and Carrie Lam in Shanghai um, last week, I guess, uh, also was, uh, you know. Quite a clear in, in, indicate, indicator that, that all decisions are made by him, and uh, I think uh, what well, we, well, we transpired at that meeting that she she, she, she was you know uh, she, she she was supported by Xi Jinping to, to carry on, uh, and but at the same time I think there was a warning coming from him that uh, she needed to deliver now. And whether she will deliver, it's another story. I, I don't. I don't think she will actually. I think. She where, where do you see the warning in what he said? Is the warning what we don't know, or is it the fact that he only acknowledged her work, which was actually not uh, an incredible praise? You know. Uh, he said very little, as you know. He yeah. said very little. He, he, well, there are words he didn't use, like um, um, uh, rioters. He didn't mm -hmm. use the word riot. He used trouble. He, there was another word he used. I forgot, but. Uh, but now, I know that, well, there's been reported, I think, in Hong Kong as well, that within the leadership in China, there's been debate. I mean, it goes all the way to early August, and the Beta Ho meeting, there's been debates within the leadership how to deal with, with Hong Kong. And yeah. uh, what I've heard that some elder leaders of the party sort of warn him uh, to be cautious. And he said in early August, OK, I'm, I'm in charge, I will, I will find a way. And the old elder leaders told him in Chinese, you can't ban that. That's your that's your responsibility in Chinese. But that's exactly what it means. 
you are on your own on that. So now to Xi Jinping about the yeah, decision. Yeah, so it shows that you know Xi Jinping looks very powerful from the outside, but he's facing some difficulties with it. And it goes back to last summer in 2018 when you, you started to feel some pushback from coming from various people in, within the system. But again, you have to be very cautious. Uh, my, my view is that it's been contested for a year and a half, but it's not been really weakened so, so far. Because so, I, I, but on Hong Kong, it has to be cautious. And, and, and I think you've got different voices trying to influence him, uh, whether you know, he took into account those. In a way, yes, he did. I mean, because he said at the beginning, OK, no concession, no violence. So uh, you want, a bit like uh, the, at the, at the, you know, five years ago with the umbrella movement, you said, you know, we, we're gonna, we won't make any concession, but we, we want to avoid a bloodbath. Yeah. Uh, so, magic. Uh, but but they, they've, kept, they've made three concessions. I mean, uh, first of all, the suspension, then the withdrawal, and then the decision made by Carrie Lam to open a dialogue, you know, uh, which uh, at the beginning was sort of uh, perceived as being a, ma a dialogue a la Macron in the Yellow Vest, but. Uh, <laughs> It's short of it, <laughs> short of the, of the Macron model, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, she has not really engaged. But uh, so that, so there's been some concessions showing that uh, Xi Jinping and, and the Communist Party itself is not you know that powerful, and is operating within a rather narrow room for maneuver, as far as Hong Kong is concerned. I mean, in China they have much more freedom to you know to repress the way they want, but in Hong Kong they have to be much more cautious. Mm. Because, reason, because we are here, you know, because because Hong Kong is a cosmopolitan and open society. Yeah, I, I was quite surprised to hear at the end of the plenum that they yes. said that they talked a lot about Hong Kong. So to talk yep. a lot, you need uh, disagreeing views to some extent, right? If everyone agrees, you don't need to talk for a long well, time. Well, the message, I don't know how you see it, but I mean, I'm sure you know, people are much more expert about Hong Kong affairs than I am here. Uh, the message which came out from the fourth plenum uh, was very mixed, but uh, I mean the, the major message was very strong and very kind of uh, now you have to Hong Kong society and Hong Kong needs to toe the line. They need to be more patriotic. They need to introduce a national security law, uh, and they need to feel that they are really part of China. And then on the other side, they said they made some promise about you know move, uh, reforming the mechanism of uh, yeah. the election, the, chasing, the election of the chief executive, without going going into detail. So whether it's going to go beyond what they proposed in 2014, the NPC uh, yeah. 2014's uh, proposal to introduce you know, universal suffrage, okay, but we have a vetting committee which we control and we control the candidate. We'll, we'll decide who, who can run, you know. Whether they're gonna move beyond that, I don't know. You know, it's, it has remained pretty much uh, opaque. So, yes? Okay, that's great. So now I'm very happy to open uh, the floor to questions. We have the, the lady here for, oh, well, it's Emily. <laughs> Emily Lau. Uh -huh. Thank you, Democratic much. Party, uh, uh, Emily Lau, Thank you very much. Emily Lau, the Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Professor. Some diplomats in Hong Kong have said that they regard the way that China handles Hong Kong as a barometer of how China will behave on other international affairs. Uh, do you agree with that, or you think that uh, it will have no bearing? on uh, the way that China behaves because actually I think many countries as you know are very anxious about the rise of China uh, whether it is in Asia, America, Europe and elsewhere and then now they see this huge <laughs> Goliath facing <laughs> David here and the people here are not yielding so how is China going to, is China going to crush us before the very eyes of the international community and if so, will China also go around and crushing other countries and uh, creating havoc? So what do you think, Professor? Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you for your question. Well, that's a challenging question. One million dollar question. Uh, in a sense that, you know, for many China, for, for Beijing, Hong Kong is part of, uh, is a domestic affair. So, uh, and I mean, the mindset is Hong Kong is like a child, you know, and uh, so the Communist Party is the father and child should behave. So and the father can scold the child, uh, and they say that all the time, you know, that the way they see the Hong Kong society. So I, I, I don't think for them, at least, there's a, there's a bearing for, you know, there's a relationship between the way they behave here and they're gonna behave on the international stage, where they have to deal with, you know, with other states which are independent, uh, on, uh, at least on, on, on an equal footing, uh, at least in principle. 
Um, so, but you're right. I mean, the, if they misbehave here, if they decide to send the PAP and people on police or to be sold in a very authoritarian way and violent way, um, that will have uh, consequences uh, for China's relation with, with a lot of countries, not only the US, uh, the EU, a lot of uh, uh, countries in Asia as well. I think people will, will draw some conclusions from that China. So that's why I think they ha they, they, their room for maneuver here remains pretty narrow. And that's, that's the positive side. I'm not saying they won't do anything, and I'm always worried about, you know, because you've seen over in the, over the last five months, so many anti-communist slogans in Hong Kong. I don't think they will digest those communist slogans very well. Um, you know, revenge is a, it's a dish you, you eat cold, and they will take their revenge, and that's what I'm worried about. How are they going to take their revenge? We've seen, we've seen the you know, different methods already used by the, by the Chinese government, like putting pressure on uh, all businesses which are, uh, which you know, we are very dependent on the Chinese market, like Cathay Pacific with any other company, they will impose some kind of omerta to, to, the, to the employees and the, and the leaders of those, of those companies. So it's going to be much harder, I think, to express uh, your view uh, uh, here, particularly uh, uh, if you work for a, a company which, which is dependent on China. So, but to, I don't have the full final answer to your question. I hope, I hope they won't send the PLA. Thank you, Richard Ward. Uh, two questions that are perhaps unrelated. One is in your uh, identification of the risks that the party faces, you didn't mention uh, demographics and the aging of the population. I'd like to hear what you think about that. And the second is, uh, for those young students who are studying overseas who are watching each other, who aspire to join the party, how permeable is the party? How much of a meritocracy do you see it uh, as opposed to an uh, oligarchy today? Okay. Well, thank you for the two questions. Yeah, demography, I didn't mention it yet. I mentioned a bit in my book. The trouble with democracy, demography is that uh, China is an aging society, and aging societies tend to be conservative. So it goes against, uh, you know, any, um, any, any uh, 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 it's a force which can sort of slow down any political changes in China because people tend to prefer, you know, to become more conservative and prefer the current system the dictator you have, and then rather than the dictator you might have later. Uh, so they know they know the, the way the party and the operates, and uh, so demography is is, a, is an issue. Um, you look at Japan. I mean, Japan has been in a very different context. Has become very conservative in many ways, electing Abe, and, and um, so yes. But it, it's it's going to have an impact clearly on on, on politics uh, in the long run. Now, second question, meritocracy. Uh, I don't know, you, are you referring to Daniel Bell's book, you know, about, and the ideas about you know, the fact that the regime is meritocratic? I don't think it's, well, meritocracy is an element of uh, selection of the elites. It's just one, one feature among many. And I think what dominates the selection of the political elites in China remains a patron-client relationship. So it's a very much a patron-client relationship based system. Um, everybody now has a university degree. Uh, uh, it's not it's not hard for you know young party members and cadres to uh, to hold a university degree even even a, a doctorate. And so then among those people, the ones who are promoted are clearly the ones who are connected to top leaders. Look at the way Xi Jinping has selected his entourage, the people working with him. They're all coming from people and places where he worked for a long time, like Fu Jian, like Zhe Jiang. Um, or from his family. So, so I think, yes, you, meritocracy, uh, I would add, um, what you said, in other words? You, oligarchy. oligarchy, yes, it's an oligarchy which tends to be open in spite of uh, the, the, um, the, the, the corruption we know, I mean, the corruption of the system, which is uh, nepotism. And you see a lot of nepotism, but you see a lot of uh, anti-nepotism people within the system which feel frustrated by it. And the partisan. So it's a mixture, but but the major feature is patron-client relations. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Next question, Elena. Hello, uh, my name is Elena Storm, Swedish Hello. Consul General here in Hong Kong. Thank you very much for this interesting and very uh, informative uh, uh, seminar. I wanted to ask you, being uh, an expert also on Chinese uh, Taiwanese policies, 
if you could uh, tell us a little bit uh, about your thoughts on how they are uh, developing or changing the Taiwan policies, considering what's happening in Hong Kong, or if what's happening in, you know, how these two issues relate to each other, and the thinking in, in, uh, in Beijing regarding the Taiwan and the Hong Kong issues. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, thank you, Elena, for this uh, very nice question. Um, well, we all know that uh, what's happening in Hong Kong is helping Tsai Ing-wen very much, and she's likely to be re-elected in January next year. Whether she will uh, have a majority in the parliament is an open question. She may, have a, she may still make it uh, within the parliament, which is good for her, because otherwise she will have a divided government, which will be bad for an, her administration. Um, and she may have a thin majority, and that's where we are, and, th and thanks in part by, of what's uh, been happening here for five months. Um, I don't think that Xi Jinping has really changed his policy, which was, you remember, uh, on January 2nd of this year, clearly uh, laid out, uh, which is uh, to sort of identify, and I think he went further in, in giving a hard time to the KMT, actually, in identifying the narrative to consensus to the one country, to system formula, which is not, it's a non-starter, even for the KMT. So Han Guoyu, the KMT candidate, has to say, you know, on my dead body, even he said it in English. Uh, no, one country, the system is not applicable to Taiwan. Taiwan is a sovereign state. You know, can you, how can it be one country, the system? Taiwan is the ROC, or Republic of China, a sovereign state. So, uh, so I think, it, you know, Xi Jinping, in a way, has put himself in a box in the identifying the one country, the system, to the so-called 92 consensus, uh, which was reached by both sides in 1992, according to which, if you don't know the history, there is one China, um, China doesn't get into the definition of one China, and Taiwan thinks there are two interpretations. In Taiwan, it's the ego jongo liango piao shu. So that's where we are. Um, but but Taiwan doesn't recognize this nine the consensus. She's not going to do it, and uh, because she's been elected by the DPP, and uh, they think that uh, Taiwan is uh, the ROC, equal the ROC. That's uh, nothing to do with men in China. So I don't think yet. Whether there will be changes down the road, I don't see it. You know, sitting being one, uh, and that's, I think for him it's a real challenge because I don't think he's going to achieve his objective of reunifying, reunifying before retiring. Uh, he may die before he, China and Taiwan are reunified. That's my forecast. Thank you. Uh, at the end, uh, function. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it will be the last question, I'm afraid we're finishing at two. No. Jean Pierre, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I thought it was. Uh, very interesting that you described the Communist Party as a secret society. Now, do you think the nature of the Communist Party is inconsistent with the idea of one country, two systems? You, can you have one country, two systems, and at the same time have a, a so-called so ruling party that is a yeah. Communist Party? Yes, can you have it? Mm, that's a good point, yes. Well, thank you, Frank. Um, well, they've tried to meet, I mean, yes, they've tried to overcome that contradiction because there's a bad, basic contradiction between uh, having, uh, you know, an open society here and then a closed society or closed political system on the mainland. And, uh, but the Communist Party, if I can use that metaphor, uh, the Communist Party is a sovereign. And the sovereign is not like the Queen of England, the sovereign which uh, wants to decide upon who, you know, who runs the boat here, who, who, who controls Hong Kong, and that's why, as far as long as the and they've said it time and again, as long as you have one party system in China, I don't think they can accept full democratization of Hong Kong. I may be wrong. I hope they I'm wrong, but I don't see it. You know, they, them uh, sort of giving in and, and letting the CE here being elected by 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 these, you know, without any restriction by the, the Hong Kong voters uh, and the part, the, you know, the very various political parties uh, uh, presenting candidates. Uh, we will compete for the post uh, in an open manner. I don't see it. Uh, and the same for the, for the LegCo. I mean, even the LegCo, you know, uh, at one point they said, well, we're going to democratize the Legislative Council here. We're going to get rid of the, the professional constituencies. And that's, I'm, I guess that they want to keep them because that gives them control over the LegCo. Even the LegCo is very weak, actually, as a, as a parliament compared to other parliaments. It's not very strong. So they could, actually, they could make that concession. It wouldn't, wouldn't be too dangerous. I don't think. And then in the back, of course, you've got the liaison office, which is a real backside driver in this, in this territory, and even more so with, with since Xi Jinping came to power. So 
I think it, it can, I mean, to answer your question, it can work as long as you keep a hybrid system here and, and you don't rock the boat. It means it's, it's, it can work as long as the Hong Kong youth doesn't want more and doesn't want full democracy and doesn't challenge the party. I mean, the reason Hong Kong has been so, I mean, has been so successful since the handover is people have accepted some kind of uh, self-censorship. Uh, you, you know, you've never seen anyone really challenging the Communist Party, but now which is very new and unprecedented, and that's why I don't, know, I don't have the answer, is the fact that a lot of Hong Kong people now challenge um, the, party, the party rule, the party domination of China. They don't identify with the PRC anymore. The China they want is not the PRC. It's not the symbol, you know, I mean, all the symbols, you know, including the flag there. Anyway. So now it's a Chinese, you know, a Nazi, you know. So, and that's very new. How the Communist Party can deal with that challenge, I, I don't have the answer. One is repression, which is easy. The other one is to ignore it. I mean, that's what they've done. Uh, but I think they will e use indirect way to sort of cut, uh, cut, cartel Hong Kong, I mean, to um, quarrel Hong Kong and to sort of crawl into narrower, narrower space, giving less space to Hong Kong. Um, but again, full democracy, it's, uh, it's like mixing water and, and oil. You, don't, you can't mix them. You can't, that's why you need to keep, I mean, for China, I mean, as far as the Communist Party is concerned, you need to keep a one uh, hybrid political system here. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Jean-Pierre. I would still have dozens of questions, and I'm, I'm sure quite a few of you as well, but it's two o'clock, and uh, we should close uh, for today. Please join me in uh, thanking Jean-Pierre and, and giving him something which is not a tie, so. <laughs> very much and and please uh, feel free I mean it's not free but feel free to buy the book and get it signed by uh, Jean-Pierre <laughs>